liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you today? I'm pretty good. Yeah? Good, good. Definitely Um, better than I was yesterday, so it's the reason we're here today. Yeah, well, you were just busy yesterday, though, weren't you? I was busy, and I don't know. Yesterday was a rough day. (laughs) Okay. So, Uh, Fair enough. But today was much better. Well, um... I ran into uh, an old friend oh, at the yeah. market today. Yeah. Um, Preston. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So, and Preston's a listener yeah. as well. Very cool. And uh, it's, those of you who follow us on YouTube may recognize him as Preston Ridiculous or something like that. I, <laughs> yeah. I can't remember exactly what his username is, but he comments with some frequency on the YouTube oh. on the um, YouTube episodes. So. Very cool. Yeah, I hadn't seen him in a while. So. Yeah, I didn't. Hear, I didn't recognize him at first. Yeah, <laughs> I admit I, there was this guy like walking up to me, yeah. like comes and stands next to me, and I'm like, "What? The, <laughs> what the hell is this guy?" And I, was like, I look at him, and he's smiling, and I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> I know you." Uh, Very cool. So um, we talked for a few minutes, and he's like, you know, um, said, "Hey, I listen to the podcast every week. Really enjoy it, and so forth." You know, I missed an opportunity there. I really should have asked him. This is an open question to the audience, by the way. Yeah. Um, is what is it that you do like about the podcast? So you can email me at michael at the liberty mike dot com. Uh, I am yeah. kind of curious, like what what is your favorite thing about this podcast? And it's an we'll interesting s- question. We'll see if we can provide more of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well. Can't satisfy everybody all the time. What's the expression? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> anyway. Um, you can satisfy some people some of the time, or some people all the time, but never all of the people some all of the, the time. time. <laughs> or, I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. Um, but but I am curious. Yeah. So for for those of you in the audience here, what is it that you like about this podcast? Like, is it you know something that we do? Like topics that we cover? Is it um, you know the way it's presented? Do you like? I don't know. Do you like the practical or the academic side? Do you like wh- what is it that you like? Yeah. In your own words, I'm not right. trying to <laughs> yeah. um, suggest anything. I'm just trying to like in it. Just yeah. trying to do as some broad, focus group sampling yeah, here. As, as broad <laughs> as, as I can present the topic, like yeah. I, I am, I am really kind of curious what it is that. Um, yeah, why yeah. do you like this? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, so. we realized um, after the last podcast, uh, well, that we, you know, we had just some some kind of odd timing in terms of. Yeah. Well, we important bought, we, dates. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had our podcast last Friday, so nine eleven was what Sunday. Sunday. That's. Mm-hmm. I thought it was that Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't really, you know. I mean, now that nine eleven's kind of came and went, figured we might have a little talk about it. Yeah. Like, uh, what? What are the legacies of nine eleven? What What can we thank nine eleven for? Yeah. I mean, nine eleven's old enough to drink now. That's true. <laughs> I yeah. I um I didn't do anything for my nephew's birthday today, his fifth birthday. Yeah. And I was like, well, all I have to give is is whiskey. And that's an inappropriate gift for a five year old. And um Liberty Larry said, Well, you can just give him a bottle every year until he's twenty one. <laughs> yeah. And then he'll have all of these <laughs> bottles of whiskey when he turns twenty one. Yeah. I never really thought about that. That's a pretty cool idea though. Yeah. Like, and it'll turn out that he's a teetotaler and he won't drink at all. And he won't drink at all. Well, he'll have a bunch of gifts to give people then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> right? I mean, you can't let a bottle go to waste. Just I mean. so that people know, though, uh, in case you think that whiskey is like wine, um, it doesn't get better in the bottle. Well, no, yeah. But it's not going to go bad in the bottle either. No, unless yeah. you open it. Well, until you, well, yeah, once you open it, yeah. yeah. But It'll as, oxidize. As it, long it as it's in time. a sealed bottle, though, yeah. like those bottles will all be fine. And maybe hard to find. Probably there. Um, yeah, sometimes seals don't. Oh yeah. Don't well, keep yeah, for that kind of length of time. I mean, if you're talking about it, you wouldn't be gifting him low quality whiskey though. I, I got to figure that a that a high quality whiskey will have a good seal bottle on it. I would think maybe not. You may be right. Um, I don't know. Sometimes. Sometimes low-cost whiskeys aren't low-quality, though. That's true. 
Like what we had last week. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's plenty of them out there, yeah. Yeah. So. Good old Rittenhouse. Yeah. <laughs> Anything bottled in Bond, pretty much. You, you got a pretty consistent product with that. This is not a whiskey podcast. That's a different <laughs> podcast. Um, it, that's not out yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, that was almost this podcast. It was close. <laughs> uh, I bet we definitely considered it. I bet bet we'd have made more money if we'd have made this a whiskey podcast, (laughs) (laughs) politics podcast, at least a libertarian podcast. We'd have made more money if we'd have made this a progressive left podcast too. Yeah, right. Uh, Probably. Um, There's enough of that out there. That's a that's a difficult market to succeed in. Oh, it's it's competitive. I would suspect, (laughs) but uh, quality of what I see out there, I feel like we could outdo. We could do it. Yeah, you think you think we're good. But um, anyway, back (laughs) back to this topic that we can't seem to stay on. Legacies of 9-11. So what did you, you know, I, I mentioned this to you last night. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I did some thinking about it. I mean, it, it actually got me thinking about a lot of things, just kind of thinking back on that time period, because, I mean, that was a long time ago for me now. Like a lot, so much has changed in my life since then, Yeah, beyond just 9-11. Um, but I mean, kind of what I had mentioned to you, like that's, I mean, so there's so much, like there's so many things like you had mentioned, like the surveillance state and the pay, like that type of stuff. And those things never went away. So those things were implemented during nine or after nine 11 and never left. Um, but the thing that really sticks out to me is like just everything from the wars that were fought, you know, and I mean, we're just now left Afghanistan 20 years later, yeah. basically, yeah. something like that. And we're still in Somalia. Still in, yeah. Which, was, which is now, I think, the longest war oh, I guess in American it would history. Be. Yeah. Um, um, and what that does to a country, just being at war for that long, um, I think a lot of issues we have in this country are kind of came from some of that, you know. Yeah, uh, there's certainly the the legacy of the terror wars, um, and uh, you know, depending on whose estimates you read, this cost the U.S. between six and eight trillion dollars. Yeah, um, over this time period, um, that's a that's a lot of money to that is essentially wasted. Yeah, um, and of course, uh, even worse than wasted, if you ask me, because not mm-hmm. only was that did that money not do anything for the public good. In many ways, it hurt it. Yes. I mean, by bringing all of these people home that's fought in these wars, that's injured, or Mm -hmm. just even beyond just the injury, just the mental fatigue from being in that type of environment, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's it it it's drastically changed our society. I would I would argue. Yeah. Um. I, I mean, there's a saying, and I don't know if it's mine or not. I've been saying it for so long. I don't remember if I stole it from somebody else. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it's, it's impossible to maintain a moral society in a constant state of war. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, I mean, that rings true. And, um, it, it, you know, and of course just there, there's so many corollaries to the terror war. It has led to the militarization of the police. Yep. Um, it has, uh, like, as you were talking about, um, you have all of these soldiers that were out there, um, and the various problems that they've come home with, yeah. uh, whether physical or mental. Yeah. Um, and uh, that certainly had an impact on various aspects of society. You also take like a young group. Now, we don't use as It's not like taking the entire workforce away like they did for World War II or, or yeah. something like that. But um, you do have like young, physically capable people that went off to do something that isn't productive to the national economy. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can't calculate the losses, um, that their production may have economic impact that having those people at home could have had. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing that really got me thinking about, um, kind of, and kind of to the same token as what we're talking about is, you know, we, um, where, where I'm at now versus then as far as, so I've always been a libertarian, like as Mm -hmm. far back as I can remember, like I've just like a lot of these principles have always just been kind of common sense to me. Um, but I never was as anti-war, especially after nine 11. Like I was all for Afghanistan. Like I, I yeah. thought that was, I thought that was a good fight. Like I was ready for this country to go have that fight. And it just kind of got me thinking that how far I've evolved as far as that goes now, because looking back, 
Like, no, we should have never went into Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, well, part of that, though, is also just, like, information that you've gained well, since that time about, like, the real necessity of it and that um, Afghanistan didn't actually play a part yeah. um, in the attacks. And uh, when we went in there supposedly to get Osama bin Laden... They, they had already let him go. From yeah. they already had the opportunity to get him and didn't take it. Yeah, of course they, we didn't they let know him that. Cross the border into into Pakistan instead. Yeah. They allowed it to happen. Absolutely. Um, and uh, they immediately shifted focus to the Taliban in Afghanistan rather than yeah. um, than the actual Al Qaeda terrorists that yeah. that were the excuse to go there in the first place. Absolutely. Um, and of course, there's that stuff that uh, that. Um, Scott Horton was talking about on our podcast um, way back when, two and a half years ago or whenever that was that we we interviewed him, um, where he just went through all the various ways that the the war in Afghanistan could have been avoided and we could have gotten Osama bin Laden that were passed up by the the executive of this country, by George W. Bush. Absolutely. um, Saying, no, we're not negotiating in any way. Yeah. And even when the negotiation became not really a negotiation, they're just like, here, we'll hand them over to anybody you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just not directly to you. And he's like, nope, we're going to war. Yeah. I mean, uh, the decision had been made. Like, yeah. this is this is what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I absolutely know so much more now than I did. And I understand so much more as far as, like, what what caused 9-11 in the first place. Mm-hmm. Because in, in real time, like, back then... I didn't know none of that, and nobody did. And the media, of course, wasn't going to educate us on that because people were asking the questions. Yeah. I mean, I was in my early 20s then, although I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to politics, but I absolutely was completely unaware that we had maintained a bombing campaign in Iraq for the entire decade between the end of the uh, Desert Storm and um, 9-11. Yeah. And you see, and or not quite a decade. I mean, but, most know. of this country was that way, and that I, that was after nine eleven was when I really started paying close attention to politics. Like I, mm-hmm. that's kind of when I started um, following the stuff a lot more closely than I had, you know, ever in my life. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, so there was all kinds of stuff like that that just you know didn't know, and the media is completely complicit to not tell you. <laughs> yeah. So you know. Because they had an agenda as well, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, no, that's just not important news. Yeah, you don't think so? No, of course not. <laughs> Obviously not. Yeah. Right. I mean, why should uh, American foreign policy be of any concern to anybody here in the U.S.? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously there's nothing bad that could possibly happen for us bombing people in Iraq for 10 years. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, people won't get upset about that and run a plane into a building or anything like that. Yeah, right. And actually that wasn't, I mean, that was that was a, a big reason given um, by uh, Osama bin Laden. It was a, like a recruiting tool. But the people that actually did it, were upset about the U.S. support for their dictatorial governments, yeah. um, I, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, the Saudis. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we we propped up dictators and and allow helped them oppress their people um, in the Middle East, and and this was the backlash from that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I I thought of. I've thought about a lot of things, like mostly institutions uh, that were created in response to 9-11 that have never left. And, um, you know, of course, the like the the first thing that comes to mind. And this was actually this was actually the thing that got me involved in politics, not initially, but when it was um, when it came back up under Obama. Yeah. When it came back up under Obama, the Patriot Act. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's when I first became aware of like how obscene really <laughs> right like a lot of the provisions in the patriot act were yeah. um and then of course again when they re-upped it again the, as the usa freedom act yeah. um but that's that's what really got me involved i was kind of i like i had just you know kind of a cursory um uh, paid cursory attention yeah. to politics before that but yeah. um but this was this got me riled up <laughs> uh so you know we so. The the Patriot Act, of course, and the and the legacy of the Patriot Act, the USA Freedom Act, um, that has uh, permitted the surveillance state um, in yeah. this country, and that's uh, yeah, that's we we can thank nine eleven for well, that. Nine eleven became the excuse to pass that 
legislation that had already been written. They were just waiting for a crisis big enough that people would say, okay, yeah, take my freedom away to keep me safe. And I remember at the time because because that was always a problem for me. Like even right after 9-11, I used to get into arguments with people all the time. And the argument I was, the, the other side of the argument always was, well, um, the, the government's got to do something. We can't have just people flying planes in the buildings. And, mm-hmm. the, you know, if we've got to give up a little freedom to to do that, then people were okay with it. Mm-hmm. Um, they also, the people I had talked to back then also thought it was going to be more of a temporary thing, that this wasn't going to last forever. Um, but, but, and that was always my argument back. It's like government never gives up power. Like ever, yeah. Like you can't expect them to be like to to take some power. And I said the same thing at, um, during COVID. Like they don't ever give back power. Right. It's just not. It's not in their nature. Yeah. Well, and um, to make this work more relevant to right now, uh, the surveillance state that was created um, under the Patriot Act uh, is what has permitted them to to turn that terror war inward. Yeah. Now. Oh, absolutely. Um, like the, they wouldn't, they couldn't nearly as effectively start focusing on American, American citizens that are government dissidents, yeah. um, without that legislation. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, and of course, you know, the, the terror war itself being turned inward, I guess that we all should have seen that coming at some point in yeah. the future, but, um, but it's the, the Patriot Act is the tool oh, absolutely. that's permitting the, it to happen now. Yeah. Uh, or well, now it's the USA Freedom Act, but and that I've, legislation. I, I've never been willing to give up any freedom for security. You, it's just it's a that's a lost cause when you have to do that. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned. Well, and I think the history has probably proven that uh, putting your faith in the government to protect you is a bad yeah, yeah. bad plan anyway. It usually, doesn't end well. Right? Right? You're better off protecting yourself. Absolutely. Um, and having the freedom to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's of course uh, a, a couple of agencies, uh, Homeland Security. Yeah. Um, and speaking of uh, turning the terror war in, inward in the Homeland Security Agency, um, what's his name? Mayorkas, the the head of the uh, Homeland Security, um, recently in an interview equated the terrorists with people posting info online that influences Americans to not trust their government. <laughs> um, and the and to back that up, I guess. Uh, I can't remember which came first, but um, mm. the Homeland Security Agency uh, issued a terrorist alert over misleading narratives online that uh, that get people to question um, the their faith in government, essentially. Yeah, right. Uh, so um, they are now actually equating uh, the the narrative war, the info war, yeah. um, not to try and you know, <laughs> still a term here with, yeah, yeah. Um, with what's his name but um the uh the people that are countering the officially approved government narrative they are equating with terrorists yeah and that's us i mean and they, <laughs> like he talked about it in the same breath as like people posting jihadist information online and radicalizing people online towards the 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 terrorist cause and the same thing as the as being the people that question the elections and question the CDC and the FDA and all that stuff. Like that's the same thing. Yeah. Those people are terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> you know. um, so that should yeah. raise some concern. Absolutely. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think that it's a, uh, a sub agency of Homeland Security is the TSA. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're being harassed every time you try and fly in a plane. <laughs> um, you can bring, you can trace that right back to nine 11. Oh, absolutely. This is not the pose of a free man. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> if that is not a meme already, it absolutely oh, should be. It absolutely is. It yes. is good. good. Yeah. <laughs> um, cause I do say that every time I stand in that machine, when I go on, a, when I get on a plane as you and should. I make it, I say it as loud as I can. So the security on the one side of the, the door can hear me and the people <laughs> waiting in line on the other side of the door can hear me Absolutely. every time. Um, and you know, it, of course, the problem was that these people were able to get on board with box cutters. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, like, anything can be a weapon, uh, first off. Like, you can't make people completely safe. But just uh, to to reinforce your um, 
your dissatisfaction with the TSA. Yeah. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, a bunch of tests have been run against the TSA since 9-11, and they consistently show that like 80 to 90 percent of um, of contraband weapons and so forth Make it gets through. through TSA anyway. Yeah. It's it's just a show. I yeah. mean, I said that when they started, I was like, "This is nothing but a horse and pony show." Yeah, you know the, the and and the and to me, I always thought the idea was, well, now that if people think that they'll get they're they're going to get caught, they won't be as likely to try to to pull something. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But it just doesn't work. Like, yeah, especially when they publish the results of these studies. Well, exactly. And people are like, "Oh, well, they're not doing anything anyway." Yeah, all right. Turns out this is a big facade anyway. Yeah. I mean, so. it's a whole bunch of like underpaid government employees yeah. um, doing, you know, the least that they can do without getting fired. Yep. Um, and since it's really hard to get rid of a government employee, that's easy to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they can get away with not doing a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, on top of that, of course, we have uh, the CIA torture program. Yeah. Talk about the the um, decline of morality in this country. Yeah. Um, the CIA torture program, which to this day nobody has been held accountable for, except for like John Kiriakou, who exposed it, not anybody who was involved in it. Right. Um, and uh, of course, you got the Abu Ghraib uh, and Gitmo. Yeah. Um, and you know, they consistently say, well, we're closing Gitmo. There's still people in Gitmo that have never been charged with a crime. Yeah. See, that's just ridiculous. Um, and they're being horribly treated. Like you can find all kinds of information online about how horribly treated the prisoners in Gitmo are. And just to be clear here, look, I have no sympathy for people who are actually terrorists. The problem is, is if these people are actually terrorists, they need to be held account for that Mm -hmm. and be, they need to be charged and tried, charged and convicted. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and then I have no qualms about what you, what you do with them after that. I mean, if, if they got a fair shake and they're, they're, they've been convicted of what they've been accused of, mm-hmm. go at it. Like yeah. I'm good, but I, I don't, I'm not okay with just rounding people up mm-hmm. and then treating them this way. Yeah. Well, and, um, just as another, just like a sub point to this, um, in 2011, end of 2011, I think it was, Obama signed the NDAA that uh, allowed indefinite detention without charge or trial, even to American citizens. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So you can be picked up in this country and um, held for military crimes without any charges, without trial, and you can be held forever in Gitmo as a citizen of this country, like completely ignoring your Fifth Amendment rights. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to, uh, act on that even further, I think it was in the same year, um, that is when, um, when they ordered the drone assassination of, uh, oh, now I can't think of his name and it's so much fun to say. Yeah. Um, I can never say it. So don't, I can't even like <laughs> give you a hint. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I mentioned it on the last podcast anyway, or maybe the one before. Oh yeah. gosh. Why can't I think of his name? Uh, Anwar al yeah, there, there you, there you go. go. Anwar al yeah. Um and his son, a couple of weeks later, who was only 16, both of whom were American citizens um, and had not had been accused of inciting terrorism or whatever, yeah. um, but had never been accused of actually Acting performing any terrorism of their own. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's not like there were law enforcement personnel that went to pick them up and were in danger and shot them. They they, they killed them from yeah, you know. They just flew a plane hundreds over of miles and away. Shot with a, a missile. <laughs> yeah, with a with a bomb. Yeah. Um, so uh, and that sets a really bad precedent. Again, ignoring your Fifth Amendment rights to trial. Absolutely. Um, if you're a citizen of this country, now I I personally think that the the um, the points in the Bill of Rights are. Should apply to everyone. Yeah, they're human rights. They're not yeah. American citizen rights. They're human rights. Yeah. Um, is how they were perceived at the time. Yeah. Um, is a codification of of natural rights. Yeah. So I think that they should apply to everybody. But at the very least, I hope that all Americans can agree that a citizen of the United States yeah. is entitled to a trial by jury. Absolutely. When Absolutely. accused of a crime. Yeah. So that's been lost. Oh yeah. Um. And, uh, well, I mean, even now, like, regardless of what you think of January 6th, I mean, I I read a story the other day about somebody who's been held, um, in prison, uh, for 20 months now, um, and, uh, never entered the Capitol. 
Really? Isn't accused of of participating in any, any violence, didn't take anything from anybody, didn't destroy anything, no property damage, no violence, no attacks, yeah. didn't even enter the Capitol, but was on the Capitol grounds and has been held for 20 months. That's insane. And was given a sentence of like five to seven years or something like that. I really? can't remember. Yeah. Um, and uh, was one of the first people that, that they tried to stick that uh, domestic terrorism uh, um, yeah. extra charge on. It, I don't think that it worked, but even still, five yeah. to seven years. It's a long time. For walking around on a lawn. <laughs> right. <laughs> of public property, I'd also like to point out. Right? No, that's <laughs> insane. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, I guess the big thing there is like going back to that first point. Um, of the the cost of the terror war, the like the actual economic cost of the terror war, yeah, like financial cost of the terror. Anyway, um, since nine eleven, um, the national debt of this country has doubled roughly every eight years. That's insane. Yeah. So um, I, I've been having had these numbers wrong in my head for a while, but it's still uh, it's still ludicrous that um, when. Um, Bush took office. The debt was roughly five and a half trillion. By the way, as I was looking this stuff up, I yeah. do want to point out that somehow um, it, was, it was like two years earlier, it was towards the end of Clinton's presidency. Yeah, uh, there was a budget surplus one year, but yeah. the debt still went up. <laughs> How does that happen? Yeah, some kind of accounting trick. Yeah, <laughs> um, that you can still spend more than you take in, even when you have a surplus. Even when you have a surplus. So I well, guess I remember under Clinton the talk of a surplus. Yeah, it was kind of BS anyway because it, yeah. it was accounting tricks that made it happen anyway. They, they took yeah. the liabilities off the budget or something like that. Uh, I, I yeah. can't remember exactly how it was, but it was like future expenses that had been on the part of the budget were removed from the budget. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but you still had the expense. You just weren't counting it oh, in the budget. I follow you. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it was like um, roughly five and a half trillion when Bush took office and like ten and a half trillion when he left. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in his eight years, so he, he more or less doubled the deficit or the debt, excuse me, two yeah. different things. Yeah. The debt um, in his eight years. Then Obama it was, you know, ten and a half trillion when he took office. It was like 20 trillion when he left. Yeah. Um, so he doubled it again in the next eight years. Trump only took it from twenty trillion to twenty eight trillion, but he only had four, <laughs> four years. years. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. And now it's it's over thirty trillion. Yeah. Um, and if it's it's going to be a stretch for yeah. uh, for um, what's his name Biden, Biden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for Biden to take the debt to forty trillion in the next couple of years. But if um, he to, really to works double at it in it, eight years again, I think he can do it. I th he might come close. Yeah, I, I think there's a good chance he will. Um, th he certainly doesn't have any problem spending money. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> that's, that's that's certainly true. So, uh, and these have real costs. Yeah, which I, I think that everybody's starting to finally realize. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. Uh, yeah, and and this is one of those things that the the re one of the big reasons now. I th a lot of people argue that um, that fiat currency permits this kind of war state, yeah. right? Like, so you get away from hard currency, you create a fiat currency, um, in, and, and it allows, it permits this kind of war state where you don't have to worry about debts. Because if you're using gold to pay your soldiers, you'll run out. Yeah, absolutely. And when you run out, that's the end of the war, because soldiers don't... Yeah. Don't fight when they're well, not paid. You can't paid. build tanks, and you can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when um, money runs out, the war runs out. But with a fiat currency, you don't. You can just create more money out of nothing, and yeah. so you don't have the same kind of restriction. Now, um, I think it's the other way around. I think the war state is the reason for fiat currency. Yeah, I, I think that there's something to that. Yeah. Um, so the the fiat currency was created in order to maintain yeah. this kind of war state, rather than that the, the fiat currency was created to permit government to spend and it allowed the war state. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't really matter which... The outcome <laughs> is still the same. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so here we are. Um, a third, roughly, of the debt um, is directly attributable to the war. Yeah. yeah. Like, the actual cost of the war. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I, I think you can make a really strong case that the rest of it 
is yeah. related. Oh yeah. In lost production, um, extra costs to you know maintain people who can't maintain themselves after being injured in the wars, um, just lost opportunities. The the unseen stuff. Absolutely. You know that um, Bastiat talks about. Yeah. Like all the all the things that could have been invested in that weren't because the money was going to this instead. Yeah. No. Yeah. That we get nothing for because yeah. we're no, and it's it's crazy because not only are we not becoming more safer by fighting these wars, we're becoming less safer yeah. because the whole reason 9-11 happened is because we were fighting these wars mm -hmm. and going over there and doing more of it isn't creating a better situation for anybody yeah. in those countries or this country. Like nobody benefits here. The only people that benefit are the people who create the weapons. Yeah. There's a tremendous amount of respect for the United States that's been lost through all this, oh, too. And I tremendous. don't mean just because we haven't won, yeah. um, but because we've been involved in this way and because we've conducted the war, the wars. And well, I, I do think that there has been real attempt to um, to be civil, I guess you'd say, uh, yeah. in the conduct of these wars. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. People still die. Innocent people still die. It ruins people's lives. It doesn't matter. The yeah. War is brutal no matter how you try to conduct it. Exactly. There's no there's no clean war. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, I think that we've lost a lot of respect. Also, it becomes more and more apparent to people around the world that we're just trying to impose our will on everybody else, that we, we yeah. become a bully. Well, we've got the big stick and we're not afraid to use it. Yeah. And yeah. that seems to be the only thing that we're capable of using anymore. Yeah. I mean, exactly. uh, you know, we we want the war in Ukraine to end, so we say. Yeah. Um, but we want it only to end with a Ukrainian victory, and Blinken refuses to talk to uh, Sergei Lavrov. Yeah. Um, and when they finally did talk at the G... Wait, no. I don't know. Some One conference of these recently. conferences yeah. recently, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, they, he, uh, Blinken took the topic of Ukraine completely off the table. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Not even going to discuss Not it. Not even going to discuss it, yeah. So, and speaking of that, we may as well catch up on that, too, Absolutely. unless you got something more to add no, to the 9-11 no, thing. No, no, I'm ready to move to the next. Um, yeah. yeah, but just, you know, never forget what your government has done to you Yes. <laughs> as a result of 9-11. I, I um, like that. I mean, yeah. there's a lot more damage done by our own government to the to the people of the United States than has been than was done by the terrorists on that day. Absolutely. I think. I, and I, well, and I'll tell you, in, in so many ways, the terrorists have won. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the way I've kind of looked at it. I mean, ever since really the beginning when we started all mm -hmm. of this um, surveillance state and all of these type of things. Um, and that was what I told people even way back then at the time. I was like, you know, if we... If, if we go through with this type of thing, the terrorists have already won. Like, well, this is what they wanted. It, it's funny that, the, like, the, the propaganda was they hate us for our freedoms. Yeah. And the response is to take away our freedoms. Exactly. Exactly. It just it doesn't make any so sense. So even if that was true, you're right. Yeah. Uh, the, the war has been lost. It, yeah, we already lost. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's really depressing. <laughs> I hate it like that. <laughs> um. Well, you know, to continue with the depression. All right. <laughs> uh, honestly, I I suppose to to most people in the West, this is depressing. It's not so depressing to me. To me, um, like this information that I'm about to present on on the war in Ukraine uh, suggests to me that the, that the, it just can't be maintained. Yeah. That the war is going going to have to end soon. Yeah. Um, not, I mean, soon is a relative term, but yeah. Can't go forever, though. Yeah. Um, it's so, not going to go 21 years. So what you're hearing in the media um, is how great Ukraine's doing. Yeah. That they oh, have yeah. launched these counteroffensives um, all across uh, Ukraine that are really successful. Yeah. They're taking back a bunch of territory. Oh, um, I heard somebody saying that the war is going to be over by the end of the year and Ukraine's going to have all of their territory back, including um, oh, what's the one that's been contested? For the Donbass, Donbass, region. including the Donbass, like and Crimea, a, and Crimea, like right. they're going to have all of this territory by the end of the year, and it's just going to be over. Yeah, well, I think that the people that are saying that are stupid. <laughs> well, yeah, I I couldn't believe he was saying it with a straight face. <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's start with I, I have a short clip, um, to to back this up, um, 
But um, let, let's start with the Kherson counteroffensive. All right. Um, so the the Kherson counteroffensive failed. Yeah. It, it just failed. The okay. the Russians still control Kherson. Um, the Ukrainians lost lots and lots of men crossing open ground trying to take uh, to, trying to take Kherson. Yeah. Um, the Russians had uh, plenty of time to launch artillery strikes on the the Ukrainians that had left their fortified positions. Um, it, it's it's complete bust. Yeah. Now, so, but then the next thing that's said is like, okay, well, the Ukrainians are doing what the Russians have been doing, um, which, by the way, what they say that the Ukrainians are doing that the Russians have been doing is what they said that the Russians weren't doing um, <laughs> up until now, which is uh, moving troops in order to fix a position, essentially, okay. to keep other troops, keep enemy troops in place while they launch an attack somewhere else. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, now that's what we've been saying on this podcast as I'm reading these military analysts that are talking about what's going on, um, is that, you know, while they are saying, oh, well, the Russians completely failed in their attempt to take Kiev. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, these analysts have been saying, um, that, well, they weren't actually trying to take Kiev. They were just trying to keep the Ukrainian forces there to defend Kiev while they were, t- while the Russian forces were taking the Donbass area. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. It's the shell game. Yeah, they they said that that's not what was happening. But now they're saying that must have been what was happening, and the Ukrainians are doing it even better than the Russians. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so um, then they they launched this attack on Kharkiv. Okay. And um, or Kharkov, depending on which side you're on, I guess. <laughs> um, and it's and that's their big move, right? Okay. So okay. they they have taken up taken a bunch of land. The Ukrainian forces have taken a bunch of land in the Kharkov region. Yeah. Um, now this is touted as a big victory for the Ukrainians. The problem is that the Russians weren't defending the territory. They had already left it. Yeah. Um, the (laughs) only forces that had, had been in the territory when the, uh, when the attack began, um, were, uh, essentially Russian national guard that are like, well, I guess they're kind of similar to ours. I Actually, they're even less. <laughs> they're even less than ours. They're more of a police force. Yeah. Um. And even they were being evacuated as the attack began. So. Yeah. Uh, the Ukrainians actually captured a bunch of territory that wasn't being defended. Yeah. Um. And at the same time, they had the same problem that they did in Kherson, which is as they left their fortified positions to move into attack, they were moving into areas where the Russians had. Um, you know, artillery, uh, I guess, um, like the distances calculated and so forth Yeah. and, um, and open them up to airstrikes as well. So they were getting ar- artillerized and bombed as they were moving into this territory wow. and losing a, a bunch of people. Yeah. And, you know, between these two, uh, counter offensives, um, the, um, you, well, we're saying how great the Ukrainians are doing and how you know, many losses the Russians are taking. The Ukrainians themselves, or at least the, the soldiers that were interviewed by uh, the Washington Post, um, said that they were losing five to one. And yeah. so that's the clip here. So j- just so that you know I'm not making this up, yeah. um, here's the clip real quick. All right. Injured Ukrainian soldiers telling the Washington Post they threw everything at us. We lost five people for every one they lost. Yes. Yeah. So, no matter how much land you're taking, that's not sustainable. Yeah. That's not winning a war. No, you ain't winning that way. I mean, even on your home turf. Yeah. Like you can't win unless and, you're the Chinese that have a billion people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chinese or the Indians maybe could win war losing five to one. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Anyway, it'd be tough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like the morale damage would be so. It's got to like pile up at some point, right? <laughs> so, um, in a lot of ways, the while the Russians have abandoned this territory around Izium and so forth, yeah. um, in the Kharkov region, uh, they they've still managed it the same way they've managed a lot of the war, which is that um, that when there's a strong attack against them, they pull back. Yeah. They pound the hell out of the Ukrainians with artillery and, um, uh, you know, air um, superiority. Yeah. And then they just take it back. Now, yeah. it doesn't look like they're trying to take back the Kharkov region right now. Yeah. But they've held the Ukrainians at, um, at the river, essentially. Like, the yeah. Ukrainians crossed um, the river there. 
Um, but they're they're not really making it any farther. Yeah. And and that brings us to the other thing. So there's this like this attack on this dam um, that was near uh, Zelensky's hometown. Oh really? Um, and it's been made out. And Zelensky said, you know, a bunch of cowards. The Russians just attacking civilian infrastructure, etc. Yeah. And that's been the the story that oh, oh you yeah. know the Russians are doing so badly now they've lost all this land now they're starting to really attack the civilian population. Yeah. Well, in actuality, this dam um, is upriver from where the Ukrainians have crossed. Okay. And so the destruction of this dam means that um, the pontoon bridges that the Ukrainians set up now have to contend with uh, a wider, higher river that's much faster. Yeah. And so they can't be kept. Yeah. Like essentially the Russians did this to cut off supply to the forces that had already crossed the river. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. They're, like there is a real military objective to be had by destroying this by dam. By doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then of course today or yesterday, I guess, um, you started seeing the big headlines that, uh, in Izium or near Izium, um, they found a mass grave with over 400 people in it. Actually, that number seems to keep getting larger, but the number that I saw over and over again was 440, um, people in a mass grave, Ukrainians in a mass grave that the Russians had dig dug. And yeah. of course, what that brings up is this idea that they just made a big hole and threw all these Ukrainians in it. Yeah. Um, but the, the video and pictures from this, it's like a cemetery. Like yeah. there's graves that are marked with uh, crosses and so forth. Yeah. Um, there's a sign on one that says uh, the uh, 17 soldiers were buried here. Unidentified soldiers were buried here. Yeah. Um, and uh, as I, I kept reading into this, I, and then I started coming across these older articles and, uh, and more recent articles that said the Ukrainian forces don't pick up their dead. Like, yeah. unlike every other military in the world, yeah. essentially, that the Ukrainians leave dead Ukrainian they soldiers. They leave them behind. Yeah, they yeah. leave them on the battlefield. And so um, this, was a, this was a combat area for a while. Well, and they're losing, um, what, did they, what did they just say? Five, five to one. To one? Like, five to one. I mean, Which might be an underestimate, too. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the, the Russians had released some information, and, you know, yeah, you can't trust either side, really. But yeah. um, the Ru Russians had released some information saying that they had opened up a corridor for um, medical units to come pick up the bodies of the Ukrainian soldiers so that they could be returned to their families and what have you. Yeah. Um, and that the Ukrainians wouldn't respond. Hmm. Yeah. So they, they just left them. And yeah. then I read this like kind of bizarre article um, that was going into the, uh, oh, what's that? Um, the, the like founder of the Azov battalion, you know, this descendant of the Banderas, ah. um, this like real Nazi uh, from Ukraine, um, that has this movement around him, um, including some political parties and so forth. I mean, he's dead, but the movement know, carries yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, and so he, um, had a guy that was like the intellectual, um, that was writing, you know, this kind of ideology for them and so forth that isn't well known in the West because his, his stuff wasn't translated. Uh. Um, but he, <laughs> He was writing all these things that's like this this kind of bastardization of uh, Nordic um, mythology, yeah. and and that's actually like this is an important like racialization point in Ukraine is that they identify themselves with the you know the Nordic Proto German Aryan race, um, etc. Yeah. Uh, not the Slavs, not you know not the Jews, not the Slavs, etc. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, it's like this, uh, so the, the way it goes is the, uh, you know, brave soldiers that were lost on the battlefield are picked up by the Valkyries uh, in Nordic mythology and brought back to Valhalla where they wait to fight the final battle um, at the end of time. Yeah. And so it's like this great glory to, to die on the battlefield. And they've instilled this ideology into them to like leave the dead soldiers on the battlefield to, for the, because of the glory or what, anyway. Um, <laughs> but like the, it, I was reading like some Western sources that, that were talking about like, well, you know, why is it that the Ukraine's the only military in the world that doesn't, doesn't retrieve their dead yeah. <laughs> from the battlefield. 
Yeah. Eh, it's kind of interesting and strange. It's, it sounds like it. That's. <laughs> but so what was happening is that the the Russian soldiers were picking up the bodies of the Ukrainian soldiers that the Ukrainians wouldn't pick up yeah. and burying them. Wow. <laughs> That's you a, know? Yeah. And so it's not. And so is it's a mass grave in the sense that they, but it's a marked grave. They just didn't know who they were. Yeah. yeah. And so they put them in body bags and put them in the same hole. Yeah. And then they marked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and they were putting, you know, civilians and other soldiers that they could identify on graves that they were marking. Yeah. Um, and they were doing it in the woods, not in a real cemetery because, you know, there's still a war going on. Oh yeah. Like you don't yeah. want to be exposed. Yeah. So anyway, there's, the whole thing is bizarre, but um, between the kinds of losses that Ukraine is taking on the battlefield, even yeah. if they're gaining territory, yeah, um, it seems to be territory that the Russians aren't concerned about. Yeah, um, and uh, then the other side of it is, of course, the Western involvement with Ukraine, which is costly. Yeah, and um, so what did I hear? A billion a month. Billion a month. Is that that was that's what yeah. that's what's cost in the U.S. By the, the U.S. Way. That's that's a billion US a month number. in in um in military aid. Yeah. Plus all the other aid. <laughs> Makes you wonder what we were spending on Afghanistan. It was about a billion a month. Hey, there you go. <laughs> um. So, uh, anyway, um, the, and the Russians have have responded to uh, an increase in the in the in the type in the technology of the weapons that are being given to Ukraine now. So the, they're now giving them um, like uh, GPS targeting systems instead of laser targeting systems that are, you know, the GPS is far more yeah. precise. More um, modern. They're, yeah, they're giving them um, like longer range weapons and, and so forth. And they, and there's a lot of pressure on Putin in Russia, particularly from the nationalist wing um, that's saying, all right, it's time for this to not be a special military operation anymore. This is not a proxy war anymore. We are, in fact, fighting NATO in the U.S. Yeah. And and that being the That's, case, yeah. we need to call this a real war and treat it like a real war and yeah. stop being conservative about how we're conducting the war. Well, and that brings up an interesting point because that is something that I hadn't really considered, but Putin has insisted on not calling this a war, a military exercise or... Well, that, which is the same type BS we do. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it it makes you wonder. So the media portrays this as Russia's giving it all they've got and it ain't much. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's not the case. Maybe the gloves hadn't came off yet. Yeah. Well, know? And I don't, I don't know one way or the other, mm -hmm. but I know I don't trust our media. Yeah. Like that much I know. Yeah. Um, Maybe maybe this can get a lot worse before it gets a lot better. Yeah. Well, Putin did give a speech recently where he suggested that if um, if the West continues to supply more and better weapons to Ukraine, that that they can increase their commitment as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and I like I say I I don't have any reason to doubt that. Like I say, mm, but me neither. The, for for all the talk in the media. It, it wouldn't surprise me if he, if the capability is there. Yeah. Um, now, at the same time, uh, oh, actually, let me add a little side point to this, yeah. um, is that the U.S. Uh, did just, um, is it went through committee, I guess, um, in House or the Senate. I forget which now. I okay. didn't write any notes down on this because I didn't want to, I didn't, want to cover it as a like a topic but yeah. while we're here might as well mention yeah. um that the the US did just uh, pass through committee a bill to give uh Taiwan an extra 2 billion dollars um well it's like 6 and a half billion dollars over a few years yeah. um but essentially an extra 2 billion dollars a year uh above what we already give them for weaponry really because obviously we're not being antagonistic enough with China right now, <laughs> and so we we've got to we got to escalate there too. Uh, and you know, it is one of these things where this is another way of privatizing public funds. Yeah. This is money that's given by the State Department um, to countries so that they can buy U.S. weapons. Yeah. So they take your money that they they steal from you in taxes, um, give it to another country, and uh, with the with the rider that they must use that money to buy weapons from private contractors in the U S yeah. 
So <laughs> full circle here. Yeah. <laughs> like, Who then uses that money to lobby Congress yeah. to convince them that they should give more money to other countries to buy their weapons. Yeah. All yeah. right. Here we go. <laughs> um, so, but in the EU, they're running into some real financial problems because of this war, because of the sanctions that they've placed on Russia. Yeah. Um, and it's not just like people having trouble heating their homes in this upcoming winter as, as Russia cuts off gas. And it, this is another one of those that you don't know really who's responsible here. Um, because the EU says that Russia has cut off their gas and the Russians say that the EU refuses to pay. Yeah. Um, now I will say well, that been, the, the Russia has been taken off swift. So is there a method to pay without yeah, uh, SWIFT? Well, the Russia has has said that um, that they will accept payment in rubles okay. to continue to supply gas, yeah, um, or energy resources. Yeah. Uh, now the countries that have been paying them in rubles yeah. have not had their gas cut off. Imagine so that. I think that there is some evidence there's that a, Russia's a, the one that's telling the truth on this, but yeah, it it doesn't really matter yeah. um, because. The, the problem that the EU is facing is that they cannot come close to meeting their energy needs without Russian gas. Yeah. Um, without, and without spending a tremendous amount of money. I guess that yeah. they can meet those needs, but they would have to spend so much more money. And you're already hearing stories about um, uh, power bills that are 10 times what they were a year ago and oh, all yeah. kinds of stuff. It's, it's, it's looking well, bad. Yeah. Um, and, but that's not even it. Like, that's not the end of it. Like, he, people heating their homes... Um, is probably the least of their concerns because that's not the only thing that sucks up energy in the EU. Yeah. All industry uses energy too. Well, I was going to say. And there, there are factories and other production plants that are shutting down because they cannot afford the energy. Now, yeah. you, you don't have the production, so you have a supply issue, which drives prices up. You also have a bunch of people that are suddenly becoming unemployed. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to cause its own issues. Yeah, um, so... Th it, it's starting to affect real people at home in a way that, that, that cannot be ignored. And I think that we're going to see more well, the people won't let them ignore it. Exactly. That's what yeah. I was about to say. I think that yeah. we're going to see more protests, more civil unrest yeah. um, in order uh, because, because people are starting to really hurt and they're not, nobody's interested enough in saving Ukraine to starve or freeze when the winter comes oh, or their families. Well, and, and now the, the uh, UK, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. No, it's just like, I'm on a roll. Um, so the UK uh, announced that they were doing price caps on energy costs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, but then the energy companies were like, well, we're having to pay uh, too much to provide. Like, we can't, we can't provide energy at these costs. Yeah. Um, and so the UK was like, well, we'll subsidize you. Yeah. All right, so there's a little bit of a lull then. You like you might put off some of that civil unrest for a little bit because you've you've capped people's like individual people's energy costs, and um, you've decided to make up for it by subsidizing the industries that provide it. But that, as we know, when you start creating money out of nothing for this kind of thing, because obviously the UK can't actually afford. Oh this, yeah, you got to just um, print it. You have to create money or borrow it. Yep. And that creates inflation. Yep. So all your other goods prices Which are going to go up too. Yeah. Well, yeah. all I was going to say is situations like exactly what you just laid out is throughout history how dangerous leaders come to power. Um, mm -hmm. Situations just like this is, I mean, that's what created Hitler. I mean, it's throughout history, this, that type of situation is You're how right. you end up with a dangerous person in power. Who says that they can come in, they can focus on the people, yep, and they can fix these problems. And they can fix these problems. Yeah, that the, mean, that the previous government created. Exactly. So yeah, and it's a true. recipe for disaster. Um, I, I I hope I hope it doesn't end that way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I hope not too. I um, what I would like to see is a nice libertarian revolution, um, yeah. where people are like were like say, yep. It's the government that created this, and there's no government that can be put in power that won't create something similar. So let's just end this whole thing. Exactly. Let's end the charade and just yeah. become yeah. <laughs> Local a voluntarist government. society. Well, exactly. Just, <laughs> um, but I, I don't I don't think that's likely to happen. That's that's yeah. my own personal pipe dream. Yeah. Well, it's podcasts like this that's going to create that world. So <laughs> <laughs> let's hope so. I'd like to be a part of that. Absolutely. Um, well, that's all I got. No, that's, I mean, that about sums it up, man. All right. 
Well, I, I did think it was important to get back on the Ukraine thing because we hadn't talked about it in a while. No, and, and, and there's things happening that people need to know about. Well, and the media, particularly this week, because I don't know. I mean, they're just the, these these claims they're making just are crazy as far as the gains that Ukraine's making and that kind of thing. I mean, you can just even just watching it and listening, you're like. Just like that guy the other night. I was like, there's no way. How does he even say that with a straight face? Yeah. Like, it's it's just absurd. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I suggest that people out there, if you're interested, get away from CNN. Um, one of my favorites is Moon of Alabama. Yeah. Uh, so moonofalabama.org is the, is the blog site. Um, but there's plenty of others like it out there. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have knowledge that you know were military analysts or intelligence analysts or whatever that are retired now yeah. um that are looking at this uh from a i mean never unbiased but like yeah. at least a like a straight perspective yeah um yeah. and really trying to describe what they see uh from what they can suss out and a lot yeah. of information is is a lot of a lot of the pure data is openly not. Well, and a lot of people that just don't have the agenda that the mainstream media has. Mm -hmm. I mean, they may still have an agenda, but it's not nearly as skewed as what you get on your mainstream. Yeah. And, uh, you know, particularly what I see from a lot of it, a lot of these people is that it, it, it is at the very least um, an analysis from a place of knowledge. Yeah. Like, so they look at the reports, um, they look at the numbers, and they're like, okay, these two things don't match up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this is what is more likely what's going on here. Yeah. You know, based on my knowledge of military history, my involvement in planning this stuff in the past, it, yeah. that kind of thing. Absolutely. So um, there's plenty of it out there. And if you don't want to read it, I will. And I will keep telling you uh, <laughs> what's really week. going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. No, it was good to get a, another update on Ukraine, though. I think mm -hmm. that was definitely. Uh, this is an important thing because. Yeah. I mean, well, it's really the most important thing going on in the world right now. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, yeah, probably. Although, oh, uh, that reminds me right now while I'm thinking about it. So, uh, Congress, like our whole Congress is back in session. Yeah. Um, that War Powers resolution is out there. So, this is another opportunity for the 833 Stop War. Uh, even if you call before, call again. Call again, absolutely. Um, uh, because this is an opportunity to at least put an end to that ridiculous war that we're involved with. Yeah. Um, but I, I was talking with somebody at work today just to try and set people's minds at ease um, about this because, I, like, I don't want to be too alarmist about the Ukraine thing. I do, I do think that it's really important, and it can lead to some really terrible places. Yeah. But I don't think that we're on the brink of nuclear war at this point. Yeah. Um, there's... There's, it doesn't make sense for Russia to uh, nuke Ukraine um, in most circumstances because the prevailing winds take any radiation into Russia from Ukraine anyway. Yeah. Uh, like, it's bad for them, too. Yeah. So the only way that I think that Russia uses nukes um, is if they see a real threat to the Russian state. Yeah. Um, and the only, and Ukraine is no threat to the Russian sta state, even with a bunch of Western weapons. Yeah. The only way that there's a real threat to the Russian state is if NATO, NATO troops, yeah. U.S. troops, equipment, etc., get directly involved. Yeah. That's the only way that this could possibly happen. And I, I think that everybody realizes that. And I hope that that that's enough to to keep us out. Yeah. Um, we'll see. It has been so far. It has so. been so far. And I think as long as Russia doesn't ever look like they're actually trying to take over the whole country of Ukraine, yeah. which they have no intention of doing, yeah. um, I think that we're, we can avoid that. Yeah. So I, I don't think that nuclear war is imminent. I don't think that it's likely. No. Um, but it any, is a danger. Though. But, but any time, I mean, this is, in every sense, a proxy war. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, any time you have a proxy war, there's, there's danger to that. Yeah. Well... If you have nuclear weapons, there's danger. Well, yeah, but both of, in this situation, the U.S. and Russia both I, have. <laughs> just just the existence of nuclear weapons is a threat. Um, yeah. What I'm saying is that the, the baseline threat of just the existence of nuclear weapons isn't raised very much at this point, I don't think, okay. by this war. I got you. Okay. Fair enough. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't get rid of nuclear weapons. No. All on board for getting rid of <laughs> nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a discussion for another time. Yeah. Um, maybe next week yeah. uh, when, we, when we're when we back. Um, 
Now, there's lots of things you can do to help us between now and next week. Yeah. When we come back. Uh, you can um, subscribe on iTunes or Podbean uh, or YouTube. Um, follow us on Facebook. Um, you can like and share, uh, leave comments, um, criticisms, uh, what reviews. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's lots of things. And just the simple stuff. Tell your friends. Absolutely. Um, we, we like to see new listeners. Um, it was nice to see an old friend that's a current listener today. That was, that was cool. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.